That's Welcome okay. everyone to yet another episode of Out of Band. My name is Faith Opio. My name is Jennifer Winnikers. And we are Out of Band. In today's episode, we have a very special guest, Curtis Jordan, who's joining us to share a day in his life, in, in the life of a cyber threat intel analyst. Welcome, Curtis. Welcome. Thank really nice to have you here. <laughs> Please introduce nice yourself. Uh, my name is Curtis Jordan. I'm currently the Senior Threat Intelligence Analyst at Kindrel. I was previously at IBM, where I met Faith. Um, I've been in cybersecurity now for approximately, you know, maybe 13, 14 years now. Uh, I started out in robotics and embedded systems and went into reverse engineering of malware. And that led to exploit development and operations uh, in the CNO, CNA realm. Uh, and that led into threat intelligence, taking all of that past knowledge and saying, given what I know about an operation, what can I deduce? What can I help to defend against based on what I'm seeing in the threat landscape? Wow. Sure and sweet, but really cool, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really geeky, right? So let's kick, it, let's kick it off with just a very simple question on what is your understanding of threat intelligence? Because there's so many different people who understand it differently so and it's a bit of a buzzword also nowadays for most companies yes Very so Very what what are we talking about when we talk about threat intelligence so for me threat intelligence comes down to um it's not just the indicators but threat intelligence is taking um atomic indicators points of data and that data is just information, right? But in order for a threat actor to have some action on a network, they typically have to touch something, right? In order to gain access, there are files that are dropped. There, at the very least, there's a connection to the network. There are things that a threat actor will have to do in the process of their workflow that leaves clues that we investigate. So we look for those data points, uh, the information, and we look at what is it being used for? How's it being used? Um, how is it being used towards compromise, towards maintaining persistence on a system? And we add that um, the intelligence portion to the data is what there's a data point, here's an IP, here is a hash. We add the intelligence of what is this and why is it there? What is it being used for? And that's threat intelligence is taking discrete um, data points on a network mm -hmm. and helping uh, the business customer understand what they're used for uh, and how to, to, by understanding what they're used for, then understanding how to defend against those things. Mm -hmm. So if you specifically mention help the business understand how, how it is used, I take it that it's more than just technical knowledge that you're working with them. Very, very true, very true. So it's not just technical knowledge, right? The safest way to secure a network is to unplug it, right? <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Please don't do so, please don't do so. <laughs> right? It will be secure but mm -hmm. also completely useless, right? And exactly. so we, we have to, to have that balance of uh, defending a network and at the same time, making sure that we don't interrupt business operations. And so there's a whole bunch of tools and um, techniques that have grown up as business and you know hacking has grown. This all kind of grown together. And so we apply those things to give the best coverage we can without hampering the actual business initiatives. Otherwise it's pointless. So very true. Yeah. I, I, I really love the word, uh, the way that you explained mm -hmm. your understanding of threat intelligence that, you know, it's not just about having different data points, but it's actually, you know, creating context about those yes. data points. Yes. Yeah. You want me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you weren't convinced yet, Faith. <laughs> um, and I know you mentioned that you, you, you know, you, you did some robotics, um, you have extent, uh, an extensive background, but did you necessarily study for this particular role of an Intel analyst or is, was it just a logical step in your career? And maybe as a side question, can one actually study for this? Yeah, it's a good question, right? Um, so when I went to university, there was not a degree for cybersecurity. And for most people that have been in the game for a long time, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. We all learned it on the fly, on the job, right? Um, as things were developing, you'd see a problem, 
Um, and maybe there wasn't a patch for it. And so you come up with some little hackish way to, to make sure that like this thing didn't happen on your network, but it was just learning in the flow of things. And so um, for me, I, I didn't study anything in cybersecurity. I did take a, a certification um, in reverse engineering or something like that. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, just been learning on my own uh, in part, you know, the dark web provides some great learning resources, but you have to be careful there, right? Um, and the, the threat intelligence community, the cyber community is actually pretty welcoming. I, I think if you have the interest and the passion for it, yeah. I would be amazed if you could not find someone to help you learn. And, but the thing is, and I had someone tell me this, um, I can help you and I can show you where to learn, but I can't learn it for you. Right. So you have to have that drive yourself yeah. to go learn it yourself. But as far as getting resources to learn, uh, pretty much all over the internet. And if you ask anyone in cybersecurity, they will happily point you to something um, for which you can go learn um, different area. And right, that's the thing too with, uh, right now we're talking about threat intelligence, but cybersecurity is really big, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, learning reverse engineering versus network events um, versus system hardening, all very different things. And for threat intelligence analysts, it's helpful to at least be aware of all of those things, mm -hmm. right? To know yeah. how we're drawing indicators out of a particular uh, file or what things would be valuable to us as an indicator, right? And it's not just get the, the hash of the file. That's one thing. But if I reverse engineer and I see hard coded um, C2 addresses, mm -hmm. uh, the, the command and control IP addresses, I, that's valuable information for threat intelligence, right? And so having that awareness of the different parts of cybersecurity does speak into and um, sort of undergird and support threat intelligence knowledge and application but it's it's a, a learn as you go thing just keep picking up things and, and learn from everyone now there is classes for it but mm -hmm. yeah. i mean what kind of strikes me is that uh yes there are courses for it yes there are certificates for it and such um i mean we might touch upon this also later on a little bit but would you say that it is definitely not something that you can just go in blank you like threat intelligence it's better to actually already have some predetermined knowledge on either it infrastructure or whatever um it comes down to a person's passion humans are interesting in that way right if you have a passion for a thing you can know absolutely nothing about it and in a few years be a master of it because you have the passion for it mm -hmm. now if you're just like i heard that this thing pays a lot of money so i'm going to do that and you're coming in blank don't do it for the pay the paychecks sure it's great Mm -hmm. But if you're coming in with no background knowledge, no reference, and you don't have a passion for it, it's just for the check. Good luck. I mean, you, you'll, it's possible, right? If you're really yeah. motivated by money, um, but it's not the easiest uh, field to just jump into with no background knowledge, right? You, you, if, if you spend a lot of time building computers and some things like that, some of that background knowledge would be helpful. But to come in with just just nothing, the the bar for learning then the learning curve greatly increases, right? It goes yeah. exponential immediately. So, yeah. So the, the funny thing is uh, <clears throat> I, I was basically interviewing for, a, I was interviewing a threat intel analyst. And I guess one of the things that got me thinking is the generation of intelligence. Uh, do you consider it important for an Intel analyst to be able to generate intelligence mm -hmm. other than just using external intelligence? Yeah, that, that's, uh, I guess that's, that's what there, you don't have tiered analysts in the way that you might have inside uh, a SOC, right? You don't have like a, a, a tier one, tier two, tier three SOC analyst or whatever, a SOC operator. Um, but if all you're doing is uh, digesting, you're just getting things from feeds and throwing it, you're just passing around data. You're not passing around intelligence. There's no context wrapped around that information, which means that when you hand that off to soccer, to whoever your stakeholder is, there's additional work that they now have to do because you, that your job is to put intelligence around the data. You can't have threat intelligence without the intelligence and the intelligence is predicated on context. So yeah. you have to provide that context so that people know what they're dealing with, how hopefully, you know, in, in terms of uh, providing intelligence, some things I hand over and I say, this you should block. Some things I hand over and I say, 
monitor for this. Other things I'll, I'll pass over to threat hunt. And I say, look for this. If you see this, yeah. then it ties to this whole other body of information, but I'm, I'm parsing out data to provide intelligence. That yeah. is the heart of the job. And I'm very happy that you actually went into elaborating a little bit on that because threat intelligence is an extremely high level concept and it can be quite confusing for some people. So if you make the statement, you have to add the intelligence around it, it can seem quite um, daunting maybe for some people and they don't know exactly where to start. But if you ex indeed give those examples of like monitor for this, block that or something, then it already becomes way more tangible to actually use it. Yeah. And yeah. I think I think that's a that's a good one, because sometimes, you know, you'll see people just uh, sending over, let's say, hack and news and saying that this is intelligence. Um, <laughs> is this intelligence? <laughs> or just, please tell me, is that intelligence? <laughs> right. Yeah, I had a, a Patrick Hoffman, man, great guy, but I would bring him something. He'd be like, yeah, so what? Why does this matter? And that was the <laughs> That's me. So what? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he wasn't being rude or mean like it was really insightful he understood that like i saw something important but mm -hmm. if i like up front i should say i should give the so what this matters because contextualize it right, yeah. there, there, right there's this vulnerability out there and it gives you rce so okay that's fine so what um it's prevalent in most enterprises that's a bigger deal mm -hmm. yeah. um and different companies do different levels of work in patching and things but when I see that particular vulnerability have a proof of concept or a uh, exploit in the wild, that elevates the, the threat level for that particular thing. And that's intelligence. Yeah. Now I come yeah. back to them and say, now it was important before, now it's urgent. This needs yeah. to happen right now. And the reason is, it's being exploited in the wild. And so our risk yeah. level is higher. So like giving uh, both the, the threat context, the risk context, all of those things play into good threat intelligence. Yeah. So what do you think? Okay. So, um, I, I want to, I want to, I want to pivot to the tip, right? Um, so we do have threat intelligence platforms that basically get information from externally. Rarely right. will you have it maybe connected into your internal, which is another bone of contention, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're getting all that data externally and feeding it maybe directly into your um, uh, environment platform. Yeah, into your environment. Yeah. Are we doing any threat intelligence with that then? If that is all we're doing? Or is it just a glorified data lake? Yeah, it, it does become a glorified data lake. I, I've dealt with a few of those and that can be a little exasperating. Mm -hmm. um, there are loads of vendors that provide feeds, right? They're just throwing yeah. out, these things are bad but there's like a vetting process that should happen that almost never does. Uh, yeah. And I recently had a case where I got uh, some intelligence from, uh, it was like a joint operation between DHS, CISA, FBI. And so this should be high quality Intel. Mm -hmm. And we drop into the data lake and someone pulls it into the platform. Uh, actually, I think it was like a setting I set that pushed it in. But then there was all these uh, flags that started flying but it was because in that data set, there was a whole bunch of information, a whole bunch of indicators that weren't vetted. And I, and that was my mistake. You know, I said to myself, <laughs> oh, this is FBI. These guys should know what they're doing. I'm mm -hmm. going to take this and we're going to pop it that through. in and move along. And that's the funny thing, right? I've been in this for years and years. I bet everything. I trust nothing, right? That's, uh, I had a friend a while back, uh, Alan Stone, that was like, Two things happen in this business. Either you become paranoid and you yes. trust nothing, or you're just like, screw it. If someone gets me, <laughs> it's, 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 there's no yes. because of the nature of the work, right? Uh, and so I, I'm accustomed to vetting everything, but I say this here is coming from the highest possible level. Let's just ship that and move on with this other work I'm doing. And then all of a sudden, and I realize, yep, nope, can't even trust that, right? <laughs> and so, like, that's the intelligence part is that. You have to go through all of these indicators. What do they point to? And mm -hmm. um, something I've implemented recently is taking any, any indicator that, you know, I've, I've done the research, I, I have a source, I have some idea of what they're purported to be doing, actually doing a query and seeing, has that been seen before? And if it's been seen before, that might be something interesting to investigate, but it's been seen 6,000 times. Someone gave me a bad indicator is my guess, right? Like it's an easy way to, to mm -hmm. vet intelligence has passed over. Now, it could be that you're owned in the worst way. And I've had clients that have had issues like that where I'm 
um, helping in a, an active breach, right? But typically, if I see that sort of thing, that lets me know something else is up, right? Um, so yeah, so you can't just take data and say, oh, I'm just going to shove this into the uh, into my sim or into my environment because someone's going to hate you. There's going to be a lot of work generated <laughs> by just but, throwing data. But but what about automation, right? Are we supposed <laughs> oh, to be automating everything? Oh, Why are you slowing this, things down, Curtis? I, I love it. I love it. So so everyone wants to automate, and I, Paul Kurtz said this all the time. It's the truest thing I've ever heard. You cannot automate away the human. Because if, mm -hmm. let's say I stop being a good guy, I'm going to hack and you automate everything. I'm going to figure out what's the heuristics that your automation uses and I will always find a way to abuse or get around that thing. It's like humans are super clever in that way. We're always going to figure out some way around the thing. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that I've, I've seen uh, cases before where, uh, uh, case in point, there's a, a, a piece of malware that will do a check to see how many pictures are in your picture folder. And if there are less than five, it shuts down. So that like, if you had a, a binary that checked mm -hmm. your picture folder and then deleted away, you just like, oh, what's that? That's nothing. But it was a clever way to check to see, am I in a test environment? If it's a VM that you've just spun up, there will be no yeah. pictures in there except for Microsoft's little demo pictures, right? Same thing for Linux or any of those things. It's a clever way because normally if you do a, a check for um, any antivirus software or for any of the, the VM processes, right? Then like that's a red flag. Like the only reason Definitely. to check for those yeah. things is because I want to do something bad. But if I check to see what's in your picture folder, well, that's not bad. But that's something that a human, me as a human, literally, I just push back to my desk now. It's like, bravo. Wow, that's <laughs> clever. I mean, and it's so not 100 percent filth proof. I mean, not everyone uses their professional computer for like photo true. storage, but yeah, it's very interesting. True. It's right? a very interesting approach. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so it would do a double check, right? Check your documents folder, check your picture folder. Yeah. Not everyone uses those things, but typically, even if it's just in the course of downloading things, you pick up a bunch of things. I, I see very few people with clear, clean directories for those particular things. So it's, it's a good way. And at the very least, if I see a ton of pictures in there, I know that you're an average Joe and you're a decent target, right? It's an interesting way to fingerprint. But that's something that a human analyst would seem like the best thing. That's weird. Anytime you see something that makes you say, that's weird, or huh, that's interesting, huh. that's something that the machine won't always catch, right? Yeah, yeah, and so definitely. having the human, I, I do not believe that we will come to a place where you completely automate away the human. You can auto, automate away like specific tasks that are redundant and repetitive, perhaps, but you are always going to need a human in the loop somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday, you know, give me 50 years and I'll be wrong then. But right now, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So anyone that's uh, beating the drum for, for automation to take over everything right now, it's, uh, it's not a winning bet just now, I don't think. Curtis is just looking for a way to secure his job. <laughs> job security well, right not necessarily i mean i i actually do agree with 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 like the under arguments that the person just used i mean yeah. i see with a lot of my clients that they just try to automate everything and it still doesn't work properly so yeah yeah so okay bottom line is automate what you can but still there is a human that is needed to vet right. that intelligence right and otherwise you can look for the research somewhere there's a there was like a, a little research piece where you had a human play chess against uh, an AI. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the AI would win every time. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they had a human and an AI play together against the AI. And the human AI combination wins every time. If what? your analyst isn't burning out on mundane road tasks, being a glorified data entry person, right, as threat intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's boring. It sort of turns your brain off. Um, it's not exciting. You're not engaged. But if you have automation that can move things that, you know, I, I've done the work of vetting and investigating and researching something, I say, this is bad. And there's automated processes that processes that kick off from that. That's valuable, right? I save mm -hmm. the analyst time, whether this is in the SOC or just in threat intelligence. Like if you have an independent threat intelligence team, it saves man hours right so they the human can do the things that humans are best at yeah, um, yeah. so i think that's important that's really good um jennifer i think i want to jump on to the uh, a different question unless you have another one okay <clears throat> jump into the next question so um 
we hear a lot about, you know, different types of intelligence. So there's like the strategic intelligence, there's uh, operational and there's tactical threat intelligence. Uh, where has your role primarily been or where do you, where do you think that you fall and mostly? Maybe also a small pre-question prior to that. What do you actually think is the difference between the three levels? So there is, uh, there is intelligence that just has to do with this is bad, this can hurt us, right? Yeah. There is the intelligence that is required for a business to know, hey, if you do business with this particular company or if you're looking at buying this company, there is a business risk there because they habitually are hacked, are known to have terrible vulnerabilities in their software. We don't want to bring that in-house. That's a, a business intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And then there is the operational intelligence um, that is looking at um, how we get things done, right? That there are certain tools that we say, this will make our workflow easier, better, faster, something like that. Um, another recent case in point, piece of uh, a particular vendor I won't name says mm -hmm. that, oh, we automate like most of the threat intelligence and hunting needs that you could possibly have. Plug this in and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And upon testing it, hot garbage. Like it did, it did. So it was supposed to be that we free up your analysts to do other work. Mm -hmm. But when you really dive into what this platform can, can do, and I'm just running tests that uh, we have our threat hunters running tests that they would um, run to hunt for this particular piece of malware or this thing that they know is bad. So the machine should catch it, right? Does mm -hmm. it, right? And so there's these operational things where it's uh, understanding what tools can age your mission and what things really don't. Um, so, or, or maybe some things it, it will take care of a specific segment of your operations, right? This will handle automation between the data lake and the SIM, but it's not really good for anything else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so yes. understanding um, where the intelligence applies uh, across possible tools. Now, okay. whether that's an official definition, I don't know. Um, in, in answer to the, the larger question, I think I've sat everywhere uh, because I've, I've worked as a consultant. And so sometimes the, the job is simply um, to help a customer get out of a jam, right? They mm -hmm. fail to keep logs and, you know, they just got a, a notice from Interpol saying, hey, we have, you know, Indrik Spider uh, posting sale of your network and here's what we have from that, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's one side. The other, I've, I've been also sort of a success engineer for a vendor um, and for that vendor, it was about helping customers. It's probably one of the best jobs I had. Customers uh, fail to share information outside of themselves, which you mm -hmm. find the bad guys always sharing information. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to go into enterprises and realize that they don't share with each other no. and they don't know what they have in their own silos, right? Yep. Um, and so it was organizing those things. Uh, True Star, shout out to those guys. Uh, <laughs> they are truly amazing people. They've been bought. Um, but in, in doing that sort of work, I've had to do intelligence that's just the sort of uh, steak and, and, and potatoes sort of threat intelligence around the threat landscape and what malware is out there. Um, and then also looking at business intelligence where it's you know a, a matter of risk, um, how much risk do you need to tolerate, legacy systems like required that are required for the business to function but are super vulnerable right if you have something that has to run xp mm -hmm. because someone didn't up there's some other tool that you have to use as business critical yep pain in the butt right but yeah. like understanding like okay well given that this is a necessity to the business what can we do to protect it right so you're maybe writing your own patches or, or you know coming up with some clever little ways to defend those things um, yeah. yeah and you know, from the three, are there is there one that you prefer doing over the others? No, honestly, the thing I love about being in um, cybersecurity and mm -hmm. in threat intelligence in particular, it's really hard to get bored. Yeah. <laughs> there's always something new. There's yes. always something happening. There, there's you know, there's all, whenever there's a lull, take the breather, enjoy it. It's not permanent in any like stretch at all, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoy being able to toggle between because it, it keeps things interesting. Yes. Um, and I feel like it makes me a better analyst because if I'm focused yeah. on some new threat, but I 
I'm not looking at how it impacts uh, the business itself or our overall risk or operations. Um, I feel like I, I have blinders on, right? I, yeah. I can see exactly this area of the threat landscape and nothing else tied to it. And very little in life is a single thing, right? I would not define a car by having four tires, mm -hmm. nor would I define a car only by having an engine, right? A lawnmower has an engine that doesn't make it a car. So I have to understand the totality of everything that makes a car a car, all of its systems. So seeing how things come together. So it's fine, Joy. Love it. I, I really love that analogy, actually, because a lot of people, and specifically people within the cybersecurity community, tend to specialize, 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 and really just go deeper every time. Um, whereas sometimes it's still good to see the bigger picture, to still be able to venture out to different uh, specialisms or to different areas of, of, of our little world, basically. Um, yeah. Happy that you actually acknowledge that. Yeah, I thought I would be unemployable after my third job because so I was mm -hmm. like, I'm not an expert in anything. I, I mean, I know, I, I know a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. I, I know some robotics. I, I know uh, uh, telephone signals, right? Or like uh, software-defined radios, and, mm -hmm. and I know reverse engineering. And I know, what am I good at? And yeah. uh, a manager was like, No, it's okay. You're called a generalist. It's a good thing. Trust me. And, uh, and so I, I was like, okay, well, after that, I just kept going where I was going and it worked Where's... out well for me. <laughs> I, th I think we had that conversation, uh, Curtis, whereby, you know, I, I, I also had the same mentality that, hey, I'm, I'm a generalist and the <laughs> world is all about specialists. And, uh, you know, sometimes you feel like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's, uh, it's good to see that uh, there's some companies and some people and some fields that value generalists also there, there's a great deal of wisdom in i think for any company that has a threat intelligence operation mm -hmm. uh, that is big enough to, to warrant having uh, a dedicated team having at least one generalist on the team is key and it's not uh, a matter of advertising for myself <laughs> uh, but the number of times that job I've security been, right <laughs> plug uh but the number of times i've been in a company and um, I see one team working on something and another team working on something and they completely fail to see that those are directly related. And I walk yeah. up, it's like, you, you realize that's the same thing, right? Here's how those are connected. And all of a sudden it, it opens up a whole new uh, area. Like I've had things that I've done with data science where I'm not doing the data science. They, they've just been working on things separately. And mm -hmm. I realized that like, oh, that, oh, that's all related. Here's how. And now when they look at the picture, it changes everything and it makes something really cool. Yeah. Um, so having that someone, having someone technical that sees the bigger picture is pretty important, which is probably how you become a, a consultant there is you need someone to be able to see that, that bird's eye view. Yeah. We're feeling the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm extremely jealous of the technical skills that Faith has, but at the same time, I'm also happy that I usually can venture a bit more broader. <laughs> okay, Jennifer? Um, I actually want to um, move to a different topic, if you're okay with that, Faith. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so um, I was actually wondering, um, also because of the fact that we kind of touched upon it already slightly in the beginning, threat intelligence is a bit of a buzzword, everything that contains the word threat nowadays actually is in our industry. Um, what do you think is the actual difference between threat intelligence and threat hunting? Because in uh, a lot of organizations, they kind of push that in the same little corner. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> Some, now, sometimes you can have a generalist, right, that can mm -hmm. do both. And faith is one of those. Faith actually yes. has very deep intelligence knowledge and hunting knowledge. <laughs> um, the intelligence side, right, is just about taking data and adding context. Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, that's usually where threat intelligence ends, unless you're doing like a research paper mm -hmm. or um, you're, you're developing your own intelligence, right? So I, I get some samples that are new on, on the threat landscape and I start tearing these things apart and I write up some research paper, right? Mm -hmm. I'm giving intelligence around a new threat. A hunter assumes, which everyone should assume, you can always be compromised. I don't care how much you spend on defense, um, how hard your people work, you, you know, you've hired the best people. Your team has to be flawless. They have to win 100 times out of 100, right? The bad guy just needs to win once. Yeah. And the threat hunters are predicated on that one that got through. If someone got through, you hunt in the, in the network, sometimes using indicators provided from intelligence that has some context around them. Um, but you're looking more towards 
uh, tactics, tools, procedures, uh, TTPs that are happening in the network. So that if some, you, you start with the hypothesis, right? If someone was in my network, what would be the moves that they need mm -hmm. to make, right? In terms of yep. let's establish persistence, let's um, uh, have lateral movement. A hunter goes looking in the case, they, they start with this hypothesis. If someone got in, what would be their next move? And they start looking in the network for anything that would um, mirror that sort of behavior they're looking for, right? If I see a cron job spun up from uh, a Word doc, that would be suspicious, so I'll get out, right? <laughs> that's um, an interesting one. <laughs> but that's the thing that the hunter's looking for, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're assuming um, that someone has gotten in yeah. and go go hunt for them, go look for that particular thing. And, I, and so it's, it is very different fields. It's a different skill set. And it's not that there can't be overlap or that some a generalist can't do both, mm -hmm. but those are different operations. Um, one person is looking at the threat landscape and saying, here's what's happening in the world. Here's what specifically affects our business. And here's what you know these teams need to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Bringing in uh, contextual information. The hunter yeah. is on a different operation, a different mission. Yeah, so yeah. In, maybe perhaps in an ideal situation, if an organization has everything um, properly aligned, um, the threat intelligence analyst would actually provide intel information to the threat hunter to actually perform their job properly. Yeah, precisely. Precisely. And in case, you know, uh, as a hunter, you might run into issues whereby you need a little bit more intelligence. A hunter yeah. should be able to go back to an intel analyst and say that, hey, I have a gap here. Could you fill it in for me? Or do you yeah. have more information that I can use to continue my hunt? So that right. relationship should be, you know, a, a mutual yeah. and... Um, Yes, yeah, symbiotic. <laughs> you know, good word. <laughs> but um, obviously, the question the question was biased to threat hunt because hey, I'm here. Right. But other than threat hunt, which other uh, would we call them departments? Uh, does specialisms department. or specialisms yeah. that does a threat intel analyst collaborate with? on almost a daily basis? So it depends on the analysts. I make it a point to connect with everyone. So I have something that I do for the legal team on a regular basis. Um, and this has to do with like brand protection, right? Um, mm -hmm. So a threat intel analyst should probably plug in into a lot of places. So I, I connect to legal, to SOC, to threat hunt, um, to our international operations, um, to uh, our customer success team, anywhere where um, anywhere our interests, our stakeholders have some possibility of risk, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the mission, right? Is to provide mm -hmm. intelligence that allows people to better defend themselves. And it, it doesn't matter whether that's about defending the, the company brand, the client, um, our own internal network, right? Supplying information to the SOC or yeah. to the hunt team going after um, potential threats, right? Like some things are elevated to a, a cert case, but that cert case still needs to go right back to threat, uh, threat hunt for them to, to go look that like, oh, okay, this did get through, look for these things. And then hunt comes back to intelligence, say, here's the case, here's what's happening. What else can you tell me? Give me other things that I can use to leverage to, to hopefully definitively say, yes, we've been breached and mm -hmm. here's our next steps or no, we're fine and here's why. So I guess we've gotten to the best question is like, what is the day of your life like? A day in your life like as a threat intel analyst? So um, I like what I do. So for me, before I go to bed, I kind of scan cyber news. Just, you know, I have like I'm checking Reuters and AP and mm -hmm. um, Twitter. And, you know, I have a few different sources of information. I'm just scanning to see, is there anything recent happening, right? And then I also have some custom alerts um, that monitor for any mentions of a new zero day, or um, if there's something like, I have a pretty decent network at this point where if someone says, hey, I can't talk about it right now, but there's a new hardware vulnerability, I'll set an alert out so that I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's hardware related and it'll be out you know, at some point soon. So I'll, I'll start monitoring for that for, before it happens. So. 
Um, typically before I go to bed, I do that check. And that's the first thing I do in the morning as well as I look at what, if anything, what new thing has happened in the threat intelligence landscape that might be relevant to any of the shareholders that I feed information to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some days are different, right? Some days there's a, a five alarm drill. Mm-hmm. And so that's all you're going to do for the day. And other days I actually have time to do a bit of research where uh, if I see something interesting, I'll go do an intelligence hunt, right? Where mm-hmm. uh, I remember when it was Ryuk that first ex- was looking, they had a, a module that was exfiltrating data, but it was looking for military data. And I was like, that's going to be the next big thing. Mm-hmm. That was September of uh, 2017 or something like that, 2019, whenever that was. I, I, as soon as I saw that, and that's something I love doing with my work, is what I call sort of a predictive intelligence. Mm-hmm. When I see something new in the threat landscape. I ask myself, if I were a bad guy and I watched another bad guy score big, <laughs> is this something I would use? Yeah. And you'd be amazed at what sort of things you can predict and guess about how the threat landscape is going to change over time. Um, and so, uh, so my day is spent part in um, research, going through my traps and uh, my alerts, right? And then uh, checking through uh, current intelligence. Um, and then I'll often have research papers that are in process. So I'll, I'll put the time in on either fleshing those out, wrapping them up, having proofreading reading done, things like that. Um, and, and then there is the, the more fun part where I'm looking at, okay, everything else is done. What's happening in the, in the larger threats landscape that I might predict things might move to. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's my day to day. It's just that constant checking what's happening and why does it matter? The so what? I'm always after the so what. What's happening? Do any of these so what's matter to me? If I, if I see something and I say, legal's going to be a little upset on that one, right? I found uh, something of Kendrill's out on the web um, and it, it's mimicking our brand, but it's definitely not us, right? Mm-hmm. That That's something for them. So I'll, I'll, I'll do those sorts of things where um, I'm that guy here. <laughs> I, I go find problems, right? No one asks me, but I'm like, did you know that we have these, uh, you know, IPs are exposed on the web? And I don't need a, a, a login. I can just log sh- straight into mm-hmm. something in the network, right? Looking for those types of uh, of risk vectors yeah. as part of the day. You know, just getting out and seeing, okay, if everything else is done. What else can I do to protect my 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 shareholders' interests? And that's what I do. A related question, um, because you already touched upon the, to- on the topic a little bit, like you mentioned that you get your information from Twitter, that you get your information from Reuters, but also from closed sources. Um, what do you think is a good balance for a threat analyst, a threat intelligence analyst, like mostly from public resources or more from uh, closed sources? Or I say never define. You You can't uh, I don't trust a single Intel source. So mm-hmm. if I see something pop on Twitter, I don't assume that like, oh, the sky is falling. <laughs> I go and I, I go check another source. Yeah. And I go, if I can get a sample myself, I do, a, I start digging, right? So any data source I'm using, whether it's closed or open source intelligence, just leads me, it points me in the direction to start digging. Mm-hmm. And that um, lets me choose where I go. So if I get something from closed source intelligence, uh, maybe, you know, this one leads me to go check the dark web and see, is there any chatter happening about this just now? Yeah. Uh, sometimes there is, sometimes there, there, there isn't. Um, if there's uh, no dark web chatter or if there's dark web chatter, but I recognize one of the personas and I know they have a Twitter handle as well, then I'll bounce back out to Twitter, right? To see have they said anything publicly because a lot of these guys like to gloat. That helps yeah. me, right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't prioritize, well, it's not true. If I have closed source intelligence from, um, one of the alphabet soups, right, from DHS, FBI, or something like that. I pay a little more attention to that. Um, and if there's something of value there, then I, I'm going to pull that first. Um, but I don't, in terms of how I start my day or whatever, I'm not like, oh, I need to go check these closed sources first because that's going to have the best information. That's mm-hmm. not always the case. A lot of times, a new exploit, I'll learn about it on Twitter or Reddit or 4chan or some craziness long before I see it in the actual cyber news cycle, right? Um, and, and so it's not about the best source. It's the right source for the right thing that you're, for the, the particular task that you're taking on, right? If I want an early alert, some, often Twitter is probably the better thing for an early alert. Whether or not it's accurate, vetted, or true, 
Mm -hmm. questionable. So you need to do the digging. But for the early alert, if I want the early alert, it's better, right? It's good to trigger uh, curiosity, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. And what has been, as an Intel analyst, what has been your hardest huddle? Hardest? Um, I've been lucky because I was sort of uh, thrown down the hill a few times already. So <laughs> because uh, I spent the time um, learning robotics and doing low-level programming, um, that was difficult, but you know, I had time to do it at university. And then I went into the business world and someone said, hey, because you're doing that, you can do reverse engineering of malware. Mm. Very, my software was to do something good, right? Little robot, please go find survivors in this rubble. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, uh, you know, I want you to use that information to take apart something bad and tell me why it's bad and what we can use to create signatures, right? Um, and then to go from that and to have someone say, well, if you can take it apart, you can build it. And to me, this is the equivalent of, if you can change your brakes, you can build me a brand new car. Mm -hmm. eh, maybe. Sort of, kind of. That, that's, that's the hurdle, right? Is that uh, there was that hardship of learning how to create malware. Um, and then to run operations with it. And so now as a threat Intel analyst, I feel like the hardest things are behind me. Maybe uh, not getting complacent is maybe the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I got information from the FBI, this should be good. I'm just gonna throw it. Never do that. Right? Fact check, <laughs> <laughs> And it's not that the, the FBI, you know, they, they do good work. They have very skilled people, mm. but everything requires vetting. And if and for and you don't know how someone's gathering their intelligence, right? If their intelligence gathering is automated, it just says explode this thing. Anything yeah. called, uh, anything this piece of malware called out to, ship that as a indicator. Well, you know, going to Google.com just to check that I have internet connection. I mean, it's something the malware did, but that doesn't make Google.com, you know, malicious, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's always that sort of work involved. So not being complacent on those things. Um, and maybe outside of that, avoiding burnout. Uh, sometimes, and I, I've, even that I've learned. Um, I re recall in previous roles, I was so plugged in that I would be leaving a client and mm -hmm. I'm getting on the airplane and I see some news pop and I'm like, oh, I'll be dealing with that tonight. And so before I get in the air, I'm already looking ahead to the next thing. And as soon as I land, I'm digging into this thing and, you know, shooting off emails or, or putting together intelligence packages. Um, and that can burn you out. Like, I'm still a human. I still need rest. So you that's balance. That's yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Balance. Yeah. It's one of the hardest. Enough faith. Does that suffice? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> do you want to ask the next question or should I? Um, well, let's just say um, also this we slightly touched upon already um, like threat intelligence uh, analysis uh, is something that can be quite complicated can be quite interesting you need specific skills for it um, would you call it an entry-level job or would it be possible as an entry-level job or would you really require to at least have some sort of working experience already in the field I need a college graduate with a cybersecurity degree with 10 years exactly. of <laughs> <laughs> uh, Everyone has to start somewhere, right? Um, I remember a recruiter said, uh, she was in Georgia Tech and she says, I have no idea what you kids are talking about. What I do recognize is if someone starts telling me about what they wanna do and they're excited about it, that's a good person to hire. I have no idea what they're saying, but if they're excited, <laughs> about it, that's the guy I want. And I, I think the same is true in this field. If someone really has a passion for it, they, they sort of eat, sleep, and breathe uh, threat intelligence or mm -hmm. cybersecurity, right? They, they may not have the, the greatest level of skill at the beginning, but they will get there. Give yeah. them the time and they will get there, right? Um, everyone has to start somewhere. And I believe in this field, there's still a bit of a, a, a skill shortage. So it's not that it's not an entry-level job. You can take this sort of thing as entry level. Now, if you're coming off of help desk or something in the IT world, you have a massive leg up, right? You at least understand some basics of how the network works mm -hmm. yeah. um, and what's required just for business operations. That's an important thing. So you know yeah. um, that someone um, blocking everyone out of Visio, important, but it's not the end of the world, right? 
um, someone uh, uh, locking away everyone's access to the shared drive or something, that's a much bigger deal, right? So yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, someone having that background maybe has an easier time taking uh, threat intelligence as a as a, a, a entry entry level job, um, but it's not that you can't. It, it just means that the company has to understand this is a asset that we are uh, cultivating that we're going to grow this person in the field. Yeah, and the company needs to be ready to grow the person right uh so not just hire yeah. but up no, right. the person yeah upscale the person okay right yeah yeah you can't hire a person like no we don't provide training <laughs> um, i mean if they're if they're motivated they may still do well but then you, you run the risk of uh, don't yeah. say never because i have seen it at the clients oh yes yeah. as have i <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're going to hire this person that's not good and we're going to keep them not good and then we're going to complain about the results exactly yeah. Okay, so Curtis, what makes a good threat intel analyst in curiosity. your honest Honestly, opinion? Is, it's about curiosity. If you have someone that is um, mm -hmm. almost infinitely curious, like, what is that thing? Why is it doing that? Why do they do it this way? Uh, those questions lead you to the intelligence, to the so what, to the thing that matters most for particular threat, whether it's a new threat actor or a new campaign or a new piece of malware, um, that curiosity about the operation, about what's the motivation, about um, if there's something novel in how they are executing either the campaign or the malware, um, that constant questioning, oh, that was neat. why they do that? And, <laughs> and that digging, right? That, that curiosity is pretty important. I think it's important in a lot of fields, but I think for a threat intelligence analyst, Curiosity and communication. Uh, you, you do need to be able to communicate what you've learned, right? Um, I think about some uh, some of the people I've worked with. Are they're very odd fellows, but I say they're my people. <laughs> they're supremely smart, but try to get them to communicate what it is they know. And unless you understand a ton of jargon and are super technical, it'll sound like someone's just like rapid firing Greek with lots of numbers or something in it at you. You're just like, yeah. I have no idea what he, and so sometimes I'll find myself translating English into English for a client, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, like, I am so happy that you actually emphasize this because there's still this huge stigma on having soft skills, meaning being able to communicate, being able to bridge that kind of business to IT world. And uh, it is necessary. It is so critical. necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's a great way to yeah to fail when you have all you have everything right, but a failure in communication it makes it it makes mm -hmm. all of that null and void. Yeah. yeah, and and by communication we mean both written and verbal because you'll have yes <laughs> you'll have to write some things and <laughs> sometimes <Yeah>. you <laughs> it's rather questionable the 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 intelligence products that we see sometimes. Oh, yeah. You need to present it to a board, for example. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and that is in that in the communication portion, right? There are some things I need to communicate to the threat hunters that is going to be way more technical. But in, yeah. and when I say communication, right, you need to be able to communicate at different levels, right? Yes. If I give threat hunt the same information I would give the CEO, threat uh, hunt is going to throw it out we'll the window. Close like, the door. <laughs> no, that doesn't That's work. Useless fluff. Right. And, and vice versa as well. You know, if you, you send uh, something overly technical to a non-technical CEO, you're just going to look at it, glaze over and be like, someone nope. do something with that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> nope. yeah. 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 No, exactly. Um, I really love that, you know, the so what question. And sometimes I feel it being. It's too direct for some people, but it's a really good question. Like, hey, so what you got? You got malware. So, I mean, right. it can be it can be nuanced, <laughs> but in a, in essence, it comes down to yeah, yeah. so what, <laughs> so what, yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, this this has been really lovely, uh, Curtis. Do you have anything else that you would like to share to the community or with the community? Mm -hmm. um, Your time to shine. <laughs> uh, no, I I I look at friends that are not in cybersecurity. And they tell me their work woes and I feel bad for them. And I know that even in the, tech, in the world of technology, you can find bad companies. But one of the things I have loved most about my work 
is I get to come across really brilliant people. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, maybe, I don't know, people have this idea that if someone's really smart, they're not very nice. But I've worked with some of the most intelligent, kindest people I've ever come across. And I hope that that sort of uh, overall culture remains in technology. I know you can get like sort of, sort of like um, silos of bros or something like that, but on the whole, like you can always find your tribe within this industry. And there are some amazing, amazing people you come across. For every one knucklehead you might come across, I'll, I put 10 good against them any day of the week. <laughs> like yeah, it's very, and, and so A, know that you can find that and B, be one of those. It's yeah. really appreciated. I think my heart just grew two sizes. I know. <laughs> I, like a love. Yes. Love. <laughs> but I'm happy to hear it. And I'm, I fully agree with it actually, because yeah, that's the reason why I'm I'm still within cybersecurity and why I'm still in tech. Aside from like the curiosity, aside from all the developments that you can go through, aside from all the interesting stuff that you see, but um the community definitely makes it the work easier. Yeah. 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 Everyone that's had an influence on me over the years, I'm deeply grateful. It's made me a pretty remarkable engineer and um, analyst. So, yeah. yeah, and you are awesome. I've worked with you, and I know you're you're a really, really good Intel analyst. So, yeah. It's the product of being around good people. It, it helps. <laughs> it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. There you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is cool. Perfect. Um, then Faith, do you still have anything remaining for now? I am good. Thank you. Perfect. Me as well. Um, Curtis, thank you so, so much for, for being willing to join us, having this discussion with us. And um, who knows, maybe next time, maybe a little bit deeper even into the whole uh, the intelligence world. Um, that being said, Thank you all for watching. Um, if you're interested in joining or participating in the conversation like Curtis did, uh, please let us know. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank